park that. Okay, good morning. Good morning. I'm Pete Daly, CEO and publisher of the U.S. Naval Institute. We welcome our audience, both virtual and in person, to the Lockheed Martin Auditorium and the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center. The Naval Institute is an open, independent, nonpartisan forum for those who dare to read, think, speak, and write. And our theme today is cyber disruption and disinformation. We're fortunate to have Dr. Fiona Hill as our panel moderator. Dr. Hill is a senior fellow of foreign policy at the Center on the United States and Europe at Brookings Institution. She's a former deputy assistant to the president and senior director for European and Russian affairs at the National Security Council. Dr. Hill's most recent book is, There is Nothing for You Here, Finding Opportunity in the 21st Century. Dr. Hill is joined on stage by two panelists whose work on cyber threats and disinformation is both timely and important. Dr. Biliana Lilly leads cybersecurity engagements and advises C-suite executives, government, military leaders on ransomware, cyber threat intelligence, artificial intelligence, disinformation, and information warfare. She's recently joined the Krebs Stamos Group as a geopolitical risk lead. She previously worked as a cyber manager at Deloitte and as a cyber expert for RAND. She's author of more than a dozen peer-reviewed articles. Her most recent book is Russian Information Warfare, Assault on Democracies in the Cyber Wild West. Dr. Martin Lubicki holds the Kaiser Chair of Cyber Security Studies at the US Naval Academy. In addition to teaching, he carries out research in cyber war and the impact of information technology on domestic and national security. He's the author of the 2021 book on Cyber War, Cyberspace and Peace and War, the second edition, and Conquest in Cyberspace, National Security and Information Warfare and various related RAND monographs. In previous years, he served at the National Defense University on the OPNAV staff in the Pentagon and did a stint at the GAO. Some housekeeping items. Um, we're going to have people, we are going to have people um, be able to do questions and uh, for our panel. For our in-person audience, we just ask that you come up so we get this on the recording, uh, come up and use the mics. For our remote audience, we ask you to use the chat feature and uh, we'll review questions and pop them up to the moderator. Um, I'd ask that anybody who has not yet done so, silence your phone. I don't think I've done it. And uh, <clears throat> please just ask you to please introduce yourself, give your name uh, so we know who you are and ask a question when you're asking a question. Uh, finally, we have copies of the author's books and they will be available uh, following our program today uh, to buy books and sign books. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Fiona Hill. Well, um, thank you so much. I mean, what a uh, pleasure to be here. And um, I've been admiring um, this wonderful auditorium and conference center. I appear this is the one year anniversary of its opening. So uh, really a great privilege to be here. It's also a great privilege to be here with uh, Biliana and Martin. Um, I mean, I guess we couldn't really ask for two better people to be talking about this uh, really important topic. And I just want to also um, commend everyone. I know this is because of the um, issuing of Biliana's book and uh, also the recent publication of Martin's book. But talk about prescience. I mean, the kind of thing that one imagines uh, is always going on at the Naval uh, um, Academy and Institute, you know, thinking ahead with great foresight. Well, could we not have picked uh, a better time to be discussing this? And also a worse time, of course, because we're right in the middle of the throes um, of the war in Ukraine. Things are taking all kinds of unpredictable directions. We've got all of the discussions about uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and sabotage, uh, as uh, Secretary Neto Rasmussen has uh, just uh, um, indicated, uh, in, in the, um, uh, the Baltic Sea. And of course, we've got um, all kinds of questions about where we're headed. And one of the big questions is what's been happening, of course, in information warfare and also in cyber war. A lot of questions about how successful Russia has been, what's the context of this, and why have some things not happened, which I know that uh, Martin is going to address. So I'm going to turn over, first of all, to Biliana, who's going to talk to us about the Russian information warfare space. 
and then Martin is uh, going to uh, pick up on uh, some of the issues related to Ukraine, and then we'll get into a discussion. I do hope that everyone here in the audience will participate as well. So, Biliana, and again, a great privilege and honor to be with both of you. Thank you, Fiona. So I'm going to set the stage for us, and first I will talk about what is the conceptual roadmap that guides Russia's behavior, specifically Russia's interference in um, the affairs of Western states. Then I will speak about a few cases where the Russian government has operationalized this doctrine on the ground and in different Western states, specifically around elections, because we also have an election soon in the United States, so I thought this mm -hmm. could be helpful. And I will conclude by talking about how the Russian government is using cyber operations and strategic messaging and specifically disinformation in Ukraine at the moment. So first, what is Russia's conceptual playbook? Well, in 2011, the Russian government issued a doctrine that's known as the Doctrine on the Information Space. And in it, the Russian government defines information warfare. This is their modern version of warfare. This is a um, confrontation between states that is happening during peace and during war. And there are, in the definition, which is pretty abstract, the Russian government also formulates four um, reasons why information warfare is being conducted. And one of them is that information warfare is conducted for the purposes of disrupting the digital and technological infrastructure of the adversary. And the other three all pertain to exerting psychological pressure on the adversary to make sure that the adversary's decision-making capability is eroded and its entire society and societal system is also disrupted. So the two main elements of information warfare are cyber operations and strategic messaging, which could include disinformation, but it doesn't have to include disinformation. And this is a part of the, the, their doctrine. There are a number of scholars, military scholars, that have tried to, to understand the concept and how exactly to conduct information warfare. And they also indicate that in addition to cyber operations, and psychological operations, the Russian government can also use other measures short of war, such as protests, economic coercion, uh, coup d'etats, assassinations in some cases as well. So those are associated operations that can also amplify the effects of cyber operations or strategic messaging in each case. So that's the, the theory behind it. And um, how has Russia oper operationalized that on the ground? Well, one, one of the most researched case studies, if not the most researched one, is the Russian interference in the 2016 elections. If you're, you probably remember, there were two advanced persistent threat actors, APT-28 and APT-29, that worked for the Russian government that infiltrated the networks of the Democratic National Committee, or the DNC. And as a result of that, they strategically released information that was critical of Hillary Clinton's campaign during the 2016 presidential elections. And they've released the information through the fictitious persona Guccifer 2.0, which turned out to be GRU, which is Russian military intelligence, through DC Leaks, which was a platform specifically set up most likely for the leaks, and through WikiLeaks after that. And after the release of that information, Western media, Russian media picked up the information and the narratives. They were um, spread through Russian state-sponsored media that's available in the United States, specifically Sputnik and RT. And those narratives and the information that was collected from the hack became a part of the general strategic messaging that the Russian government was pushing around the, the US presidential elections. In addition to this now known as hack and leak operation, we now know that the Russian government also had a whole army of trolls and bots that were working at the IRA or the um, Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg that were spreading divisive narratives and disinformation through our social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, and others. And we know that they reached at least between 20 million and 120 million people for some of these messaging. Um, in addition to that, other measures that we now know the Russian government supported at the time or sponsored at the time even, were a number of rallies across different states in the United States that were pro or against different um, political candidates. So in this particular case, the information playbook included at least, at least cyber operations, the known operations, cyber operations, disinformation and strategic messaging, and sponsoring of protests. So whether that operation was successful or not, it really depends on how we measure success. If we're talking about whether the hack and leak operation was successful, 
the hack was definitely successful. Information was leaked to the, to the public. It was picked up by the press. So that I would say was a success story. Whether the Russian inf interference in the 2016 elections decided the election, I don't think there's any rigorous methodological study that can prove that for sure even today. So I would say that is not clear. But still, I think from Russia's perspective, for a number of reasons, and one of them being their rep the reputational success, this operation probably I would label as being successful because one of the, um, the major, I would say, priorities for the Russian government is to be seen as a great power. And we talked about the Russians interfering in the elections for so long. We invested resources in improving our defenses after the 2016 elections. And for me, that is a win for Putin's reputation and for Russia's status abroad. And the Russians tried to replicate that particular hack and leak operation just about a year later in France during the 2017 French elections. There were two candidates. One of them was pro-Russian. The other one was very much anti-Russian. President Macron, and the Russian, um, again, cyber threat actors tried to infiltrate the campaign of then presidential candidate Macron, and they successfully did that, collected information from his personal email account and from his campaign, and also released it, tried to release it to the public. We know that at least one GRU account, military, Russian military intelligence, was involved in trying to spread that information to different French individuals, whether, and we know this from a 2020 US indictment, so quite a few years later. But we don't know if that particular request was successful. We know that the information was spread through WikiLeaks and other um, sources. But the, that information didn't spread as much as the leaked information in the 2016 elections. And during the election process, Macron eventually won the election. So I would say that this particular case may not have been as successful from Russia's perspective as was the, um, the interference in the 2016 elections. So in this case, they de the Russians definitely used hack and leak operations, some disinformation most likely, um, and um, the operation wasn't as successful. In other cases, for example, the, um, the elections in Montenegro, the Russians were a lot more aggressive, and in addition to disinformation and DDoS attacks, which are rather disruptive, they also tried to assassinate the prime minister of Montenegro. So this was a country that was about to be um, to discuss NATO accession and is right now a NATO member, and it's closer to Russia's borders. And one of the conclusions that I draw in my book from looking at different cases of information warfare is that the Russian government tend to be, tends to be a lot more aggressive in countries closer to its borders. So Montenegro and Bulgaria and Estonia are one of those examples. So this is how Russia operationalizes its, its information warfare playbook. So what have we seen, the third point I wanted to bring, what have we seen in Ukraine so far? Well, the war is still taking place. So it's, I'm sure that we'll have a lot more assessments and a lot more analysis to do in the, in the years to come. But so far we know that the Russian government has started to conduct reconnaissance on targets and preposition malicious malware about an year in advance of the conflict. We know that at least six APTs, or Advanced Persistent Threat Actors, were engaged in reconnaissance and prepositioning of malware on different targets. And we have seen how the Russian government has used a lot of cyber operations. They were about, based on Ukraine's estimates, about 1,600 significant cyber attacks since the beginning of this year against Ukrainian infrastructure. So the number of cyber operations is massive. I would say that the most notable so far, and we have a range of different types, but the, no, the most notable so far, I would say, are the disruptive DDoS attacks, especially in the beginning of the war. We had a disruption of um, several waves of DDoS attacks, even before tanks rolled through the border, and they temporarily, dis temporarily, temporarily disrupted the um, networks of the, of the government, so government infrastructure, as well as um, two of the largest banks in Ukraine. The other notable cyber operations that we have seen throughout the war are uh, operations that use uh, wiper malware, which is a very disruptive type of mal malware, and those operations are used to wreak havoc on a network to disrupt the system. And we have seen a few examples of those, some of them more successful or less successful than others, and Martin is going to talk about this more. One of the, um, the examples that I wanted to bring up, which shows how they could fail uh, luckily sometimes was the use of Indestroyer 2, which 
um, we believe was meant to be used. It's a wiper malware, which probably was used to, for the Russians to try to um, turn off the power for about 2 million Ukrainians, and they tried and they failed in doing that and causing any permanent damage. Um, and so cyber operations have, be, have been used, ex, used extensively, and Ukraine, as well as foreign partners, have been, um, to a certain extent, very good at defending their networks. And I'll let Martin talk more about this. On the disinformation side, we have all sorts of disinformation narratives about Ukraine that have been proliferated through social media, Telegram, Russian state-sponsored media for, for years. And when we talk about this stage of the war, I think it's very important to remember that this war started in 2014, when, Ukraine, uh, when Crimea was annexed by Russia. And what happened, what, what we are seeing in, since February of this year is a massive escalation. Yes, we can call it war, but we have to remember that the major disruption started already in 2014. So since, since this stage of the war, this stage of the war starting in February, we have seen a lot of interesting examples of how cyber operations and disinformation have been used together. And I think this is exactly, because this is the core of information warfare, I think those are the examples that to me are the most interesting ones. For example, the Facebook accounts of uh, military leaders in Ukraine were hijacked and um, they were used to send messages to the, to the troops to ask them to surrender. Um, in another case, two radio stations were hacked again and narratives about Zelensky being hospitalized and severely wounded were spread to, to the soldiers. And those, for me, are the really the, the operations to in the hack and leak or the, the hack and I would say hack and deceive almost operations. I'm still thinking about exactly how to formulate this, but it will be something of, of that nature, where the Russians are trying to erode our the, the Ukrainians' will to fight. They're trying to to, to deceive and discourage the, the population from fighting back. And I would say that those are probably the types of operations we have to pay attention to uh, because the Russians are good at them to a certain, ex to a certain extent and uh, we may see more of those in the future. Thanks very much, Bulyana. I just want to um, touch on a couple of points before I turn over to Martin because I think there's a, a number of things Bulyana um, has said to you that we should keep in our mind as we think forward to the discussion. I mean, first of all, it's that idea that you know, a lot of this started back in 2014, one could actually say it starts even earlier because Putin has been trying to shape the information landscape for a very long time about the idea of Ukraine in many respects belonging to Russia. And, you know, part of that is taking advantage of a lack of concrete information or a lack of understanding and a, a deep appreciation of regional history on our part as well. So information and misinformation and information was targeted inside of Ukraine, as really now is laid out inside of Russia itself, but also here, we're part of that as well not just 2016, but for a longer period of time. I just engaged in a piece of misinformation, by the way, at the very beginning by accident, by talking about Rasmussen, who was the former uh, NATO Secretary General instead of Stoltenberg. But this actually also shows how things you know, take, take hold uh, when you know, you're not, um, uh, people are not you know, kind of on top of their game or understanding what's happening. You know, the debate that we're having in the United States about are we to blame for what's happened in Ukraine? Is this all about NATO? You know, this is going on in academic circles. I mean, part of this is a frame uh, 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 produced by Vladimir Putin. How many people thought that Crimea was you know, intrinsically part of Russia at the beginning of this conflict where the history is much more complex? And that's, again, also part of misinformation and information warfare. Billions also touched um, uh, briefly on, um, and she has a more in-depth uh, discussion uh, on Montenegro, but also in her book there's a, a, an in-depth discussion of Germany and the hacking of the Bundestag. And from my time in government, I learned something very interesting about this episode, is that the German um, uh, security services fully anticipated that the Russians would do the hack and release of the Bundestag emails Absolutely. in 2017, ahead of the G20 that was being hosted by Angela Merkel, the German chancellor in Hamburg. And then they decided not to. And part of the reason was because there was a huge rift between uh, the United States and Germany at this point over Edward Snowden and you know, all of the revelations uh, about uh, NSA's uh, collection, for example, and also because, of course, President Trump uh, was being quite insulting about Germany at the time, and the Russians actually thought that if they released this information, this is um, uh, you know, now, let's just say, coming from a lot of senior German circles, that it actually might help the United States and Germany to patch things up because we'd realize that we were both being targeted by the similar sorts of operations. 
So, you know, in one case, political issues overrode what had been, they thought, a, a successful operation. And I think that might tie into what Martin's about to um, speak about here in terms of Ukraine, because we've been anticipating all kinds of things happening in Ukraine, as Biliana has laid out, but there may be other considerations at play and, you know, perhaps other dynamics. So, Martin, over to you, and uh, thank you again, Biliana, for a great overview. Okay, thank you. Uh, one of the things I tell my students, uh, the nice little school across the creek here, is... Um, you have to spend almost as much time thinking about things that didn't happen as things that did happen. And the question, of course, what I'm going to ask is, why haven't we really seen more cyber activity in Ukraine? Why haven't we seen more cyber attacks? Or more specifically, why haven't we seen more successful and efficacious cyber attacks? Okay, why haven't what's taken place in cyberspace moved the needle? And now as a final proof that I am an academic, let me just toss out a definition. When we talk about cyber attack, we talk about the use sending messages to systems that result in the systems either not working or not working correctly. This is distinct from the activity that people call cyber espionage, which is getting into systems, collecting information, bringing it back home, and using it for national security decision making, of which there could be a great deal of which we don't see and we may never see. And finally, you have to distinguish cyber attack from cyber crime something that we do here in the United States, not quite so well in Russia, but it's a diversion. And the other thing I want to say is two quick caveats. One is the war isn't over. And the second is things may have already happened in the war that we may not be aware of until well after, after the fact. Okay, so with all that out of the way, I'm going to echo what you've heard before and start a discussion of this war by looking at 2014, when the Russians first started their aggression against uh, Ukraine. In that aggression, there was actually a great deal of physical combat that took place in the Donbass, in theory only against dissident elements, in practice against the Russians. And there were a number of folks who, looking on this, said, hey, this is the first time we really have a test of the proposition that you cannot have two competent and advanced militaries go after one another uh, without cyber becoming a major player. And we just didn't see that uh, taking place on the battlefield very much. We didn't really see that even in terms of strategic cyber attacks. That is, cyber attacks against non-military targets in Ukraine whose primary purpose is to erode the will of the population that is being targeted. So, what did we see in the first two years of the conflict? Uh, we saw DDoS attacks. We saw an attempt to uh, misreport an election in Ukraine. We saw electronic warfare. We saw some physical destruction of um, telecommunications infrastructure. I'm sure we saw a lot of cyber espionage, but again, not very much. Okay, later it turns out that the Russians had successfully taken down on two occasions a power facility in western Ukraine, a power facility in uh, Kiev, and in 2017, there was the NotPetya cyber attack, which disabled about 10% of Ukraine's computers, which, by the way, incidentally caused a lot more damage outside Ukraine than it caused inside Ukraine. But otherwise, we didn't really see all that much. So, I st so back then, I started thinking, okay, why haven't we seen very much? A couple answers suggested themselves, one w of which is that those militaries were not as advanced as we thought. And let me just step back here and make a comment about the United States. The United States and its Western allies are far and away the most technologically advanced militaries with the highest dependence on information systems. And in the invention of cyber war, we may well have developed a form of warfare that's uniquely suited against our own forces as opposed to the forces that we may happen to fight. Ukraine's military in 2014 had not received much in the way of new equipment for almost 25 years, and the Russian acquisition of equipment was basically uh, slowed down substantially and only picked up several years before 2014. So the technical level of both militaries wasn't of the sort that would allow a great deal of cyber operations. There were other factors in play. One is that the um, infrastructures of Ukraine and Russia were still interconnected to one another. 
as a leftover from the Cold War. And another possibility is that Russia and Ukraine both have motives not to escalate vis-a-vis one another. Okay. So, there's a run-up to the war. There's a great perception that Russia, in fact, was going to use a lot more cyber operations, particularly because the war that's, the phase of the war that started in 2022 was far more overt than what the Russians had started in 2014. And if it was overt, there was much less reason to hold back. Okay? So we sort of expected three types of attacks. One, attacks on each other's military. Number two is attacks on infrastructure in Ukraine. And number three, as a sort of a warning, attacks on infrastructure in the West. Okay? Again, people have been surprised universally by why we haven't seen much more. So let me start off with a brief review of what we did see. The most obvious example is the Russia's attack on the Viasat satellite network, which was actually not an attack on the satellites themselves, but an attack on the receivers for the network, which had a broad effect. The aim was to disrupt Ukrainian command and control in the early days of the war. Uh, The evidence suggests, in fact, that although satellite service was disrupted, Ukrainian command and control carried on pretty much the way they were going to do. There was a lot of collateral, collateral damage, several thousand wind farms, for instance, in Germany, lost contact with main headquarters, although, to be fair, the wind turbines still kept spinning, so that's what really wanted them to do. Um, The Russians, as mentioned, tried to take down Ukrainian electricity. They failed twice that we know of. Uh, They may have failed a lot more times that we don't know of because they hadn't gotten far enough to excite the, basically excite the kind of defenses that we know about, okay? There have been Russian attacks on Ukrainian government services. There have been, uh, they have been knocked offline from time to time. Data stores uh, were destroyed. Most of them were recovered, okay? But if you look at the, Russia's kinetic warfare, in other words, the use of violence, there's very little indication that Russians believed that they could use cyber as a substitute for kinetic. There was the Russian attack on the television tower in Kyiv, which is a good indication that the Russians had no confidence that they could take care of the tower through non-technical means. Um, Although the Russians had failed to take down Ukrainian power supplies using cyber, after the Kharkiv offensive, uh, the Russians retaliated by using kinetic methods to take down uh, electricity supplies in Kharkiv. Okay? Ironically, we may look back and find that the most successful hacking attempts were not by Russia, not by Ukraine, not by the West, but by a number of dissident Belarus, Belarusians who, using a combination of cyber and physical means, managed to disrupt the rail operations from Belarus in the direction of Kyiv in the early days of the war that hobbled the Russia's ability to mobilize forces in the direction of Kyiv. Okay, um, I had initially thought that one of the reasons that we didn't see much in the way coming out of Russia is because Putin pretty much kept everybody in the dark and best guess, and this is no more than a best guess, that the Russian cyber services were not told there was going to be an invasion until about a month before, which is to say mid-January. And one of the characteristics of cyberspace operations is it takes a long time for a really good operation. You have to have access, you have to move around, you have to understand the system you're dealing with. So it's not one of those things that takes place overnight. So in the course of time, you would see more. Well, it is now late September. We are eight months past mid-January. Still haven't seen very much. So let's speculate on why we haven't seen very much. Reason number one. The Ukrainians have put up a more sophisticated defense. Eight years of facing Russian activity between 2014 and 2022 have made the Ukrainians uh, much more sophisticated. Okay? In other words, because they were braced for this, because this is one of those things that could well happen, whether or not Russia conducted a physical invasion to Ukraine, they were alert. They were not a uh, a sleeping defender. Item number two correlated to that is they were getting help from the United States, from the UK, from Microsoft, from Google, 
Um, which, by the way, is an interesting element of war that, you, that is different from, um, from kinetic warfare, is you can get serious help from private corporations. Um, and probably a lot of other nations that aren't talking about it too much, but that doesn't mean that they're not helping. Okay. Um, item number three. There has been an argument that the activities of the volunteer pro-Ukrainian, as it were, cyber army, have pinned down offensive Ukraine, uh, Russian hackers. Uh, I'm a bit skeptical of this for two reasons. One is the efficacy of the large number of pro-Ukrainian hackers hasn't been very impressive either. And the other is that the skill set required to do offensive cyber is sufficiently different from the skill set required to do defensive cyber that pinning down your defensive cyber warriors doesn't have much of an effect on your ability to carry out offenses. Okay. Um, we also have not seen expectations about, about cyber attacks on Western infrastructures. Okay. Couple, now, one would think that the Russians are just waiting for this moment, which leads to the question, if you're going to hold the threat of cyber attacks over somebody, you have to communicate what it is you don't want them to do. And if they go ahead and do it, you unleash the attack as a way of reinforcing your deterrence. Well, if the purpose of Russia was to inhibit the West from sending in arms to Ukraine, there's very little we haven't sent yet. There's a few things. But we have sent a great deal of material in the direction of Ukraine. Okay, if it was a question of non-involvement, again, what is it that they're exactly waiting for? Now, it is true that there is a heightened state of watchfulness within the defense infrastructures as a result of the war in Russia. It's not entirely clear um, what role that plays. Again, not to go overly Hegelian on you folks, but he was right when he said that the owl of Minerva flies at dusk. In other words, there is a lot we will not understand about this conflict until the conflict is in our past. So let me take out two broad notions out of this. Um, and of course, is in cyberspace, as in the rest of the world, they can be contradicted by the things that we read in the newspaper tomorrow. First broad notion is that when you evaluate a tool of aggression, a tool of war, you can't simply look at what happens if somebody does it. You also have to look at the countermeasures. Okay, measure begets countermeasure, countermeasure begets countermeasure, and so on and so forth. To look at a tool of war and say, boy, this is really powerful. It's going to change war. This is something we have to, you know, we have to take into consideration requires that you also go in faced with that kind of weapon. What are people going to do differently? A lot of the early success of cyber operations came against naive adversaries. Our adversaries all over the world, whether they're good guys or bad guys, okay, in other words, the defenders against cyber operations, they're not so naive anymore. So now that when you look at the power of cyber, you also have to look at the capabilities of cyber defense. Okay, the second thing is, I think we're starting to realize that while cyberspace operations are militarily relevant, they are militarily relevant in a niche contest. Okay, you want to have a capability for doing it because you want to take advantage of opportunities that you will not see until you probe. And from time to time, opportunities will arise. But this isn't like artillery where you can just move 10,000 tubes to the front and blast away until there's nothing left. Cyber operations have to be used carefully and your expectations must be tempered. From time to time you will get lucky and you want to exploit your good luck as much as possible. But it's the exploitation of the good luck and the skill that is critical, not merely the mass application of force. Well, that's great, Martin. Thank you very much. I actually want to pick up <clears throat> on a couple of things that you've said um, to just try to um, pull a little bit more out of both uh, you and Biliana here and also try to bring everybody else into the discussion. And I know that our online um, audience as well should be sending us uh, questions and hopefully I'll be able to see them shortly on the screen. But I'd, I'd like to you know, get, uh, prompt all of you to start to think about how to follow up here. 
And I'd like to um, bridge into a discussion with the audience with some reflections on what's happening right now. So we've got this unprecedented mobilization of people in, in, in Russia uh, to uh, try to change uh, the state of affairs on the actual physical battlefield because Putin has obviously lost the momentum there. And this mobilization is clearly having some pretty significant effects. And again, this is the first mobilization since World War II, supposed to be partial, 300,000 people, but of course the rumor mill of disinformation inside of Russia itself, not spread by the Kremlin probably, is that they're looking for 1.2 million because of uh, you know, obviously the, the huge losses on the battlefield. And people are at the heart of all of this, just as they are at the heart of what you've been saying here, Martin, as well. And I was thinking as you were discussing, and of course I had the advantage of seeing what you were going to talk about in advance and also Biliana, about the people factor. I mean, we're talking about cyber as a transnational tool, an instrument, but people move as well. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons, just from my own observations of why Ukraine has been more successful, we might have thought, in terms of defense and not as naive, is because Ukrainians have been on the move for a very long time, 30 years, in fact. So the, the, one of the most important places, of course, uh, for cyber and IT is Silicon Valley. Now, we tend to think of Russian speakers who've moved to Silicon Valley as all being Russian. Well, that's what Mr. Putin thinks and why he's invaded Ukraine. And guess what? Most of them are often Ukrainian. Many of them are Jewish. And they came from the old lands of Pale of Settlement, which is actually Belarus and Ukraine, not Russia. Similarly in Israel, a lot of the people who brought us Waze and a lot of the other you know, high-tech instruments happen to be from Ukraine and Belarus, even if they're Russian speakers. And I was at a conference that was a lot of IT um, billionaires and Silicon Valley people in Aspen over the weekends, and I was struck by how many people actually came from Ukraine. And many of them have been right back in there helping Ukraine in defense, uh, but also in trying to kind of you know, think about how Ukraine is going to develop itself over the longer term. So a lot of the people that Bilyan, who's from Bulgaria, um, has been interacting with in Silicon Valley happen to be Ukrainian, not actually Russian. And they've, and they've re-identified um, themselves as Ukrainian over a period of time as well. Now, the other thing, um, I had a friend uh, who was a sociologist in Armenia send me a note this morning, uh, which drew my attention. And he says, now, the highest concentrations of IT specialists now uh, outside of Silicon Valley are in Armenia and Kyrgyzstan. Why is that? Because it's all the Russians fleeing. So not just have people fled as a result of mobilization, but it's, you know, 200,000, tens of thousands trying to get out into Georgia at the moment, but people have been fleeing since the conflict started. And we're also seeing an awful lot of Russians, IT specialists, because they're all the younger guys who are going to get called up in this mobilization or, do, or opposing the war, heading off somewhere else. So now in the regions around uh, 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 Russia, you're getting a whole lot of people who don't want to be part of this war, who can no longer be necessarily mobilized for IT. And I wanted to ask Biliana, you know, from the perspective of Silicon Valley and the private sector, because people are part of private sector companies, but people are also moving themselves and wanting to do something. I mean, what you're seeing. And then, Martin, you know, how you think this might play out in what you've just laid out, which I thought was very important. But, Biliano, you've been seeing all these people for years, probably at Rand and, you know, Deloitte and everywhere else that you've uh, been working. Yes, and I would, this is exactly the point I wanted to bring up, Fiona. It's a great point. More than 1,000 companies have left Russia, and some of them are in the IT sector. And what they did, a lot of them took their most capable workers with them and they relocated them. They provided basically opportunities for, for the Russians, the, the smartest Russians that were in those offices in Moscow, St. Petersburg, and other places to leave the country with their families. And some of them left for exactly those countries. Others were relocated to New York, others to Poland. So I, um, I have anecdotal evidence on this because companies wouldn't really, they don't want to, Com uh, the private sector tends to try to stay politically agnostic, which at this point is not really possible because of the conflict. But I think, so they're not really disclosing a lot about the numbers of people that they have taken out of the country, but from conversations that I've had with a few really big companies that left, I know that they have moved thousands of people out. So I would, I would say, based on that anecdotal evidence, and I would love to do a study and see how many people exactly left with companies, but I would, my guess would be a lot. So, um, Biliana's you know, observations about that are obviously in the present state of the conflict. 
But Martin, do you think that might have had some impact beforehand? Because, of course, as you well, we've both pointed out, all of us have pointed out, 2014 was the annexation of Crimea. An awful lot of you know, people left Crimea. But you know, Ukrainians, uh, as Ukrainian citizens, have been on the move for 30 years of independence. And I've just been, as I said, astounded by the number of people that I think you know, they speak Russian, but they're not Russian at all, that I've met in the high-tech world. I, you remind me of an anecdote. Um, about 15 years ago, I was in Israel, and somebody was boasting that Herzliya, which is a suburb north of Tel Aviv, has the highest concentration of computer viruses per capita in the world. <laughs> and then he paused for a minute and he says, a perfect combination of Israeli intelligence and Russian ethics. <laughs> um, so yes, there's been a huge diaspora. There's been a huge diaspora, as you point out, starting in 1990, which has enriched Silicon Valley um, and hasn't done such favors for Russia and Ukraine. Now, of course, in the last week, there's even been a very fast diaspora. Um, I'm not entirely certain, however, that that diaspora is going to convert into cyber offense, certainly not cyber offense, or cyber defense for a while. IT skills are a very good way to get into the business, but then there's a long training curve and a habit of mind curve between a generic IT skill and the use of cyber. I suspect that if you're good in cyber in Russia, uh, you've been finding employment in one of three places. One is the Russian military, and I don't think those folks are being allowed to leave anytime soon. Another is in Russian criminal groups, and a lot of those folks are scared to leave for some very obvious reasons. And the third is in Russian defense, and a lot of those folks are probably leaving, again, if they can get away with it. Um, now, does that mean that Armenia is going to become the next Silicon Valley, or that Kazakhstan is going to become the next Silicon Valley? Well, probably not, because it takes more than smart people on the way through to make to have the kind of intellectual, financial, and physical infrastructure that are come together in a place like Silicon Valley or, uh, or Israel or places like that. Yeah, but it's certainly a phenomenon that I think we all should be watching. I mean, I think you're obviously right. I think you know, people, I mean, anyway, Armenia doesn't have the capacity for you know, kind of uh, taking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people and other countries may find it difficult too, but these are obviously way stations for something else. I think, you know, kind of in terms of the observation so far, we can see it's certainly depleting uh, some of Russia's skill set. And in fact, I mean, there were letters sent uh, by the uh, Ministry for Aviation, Civil Aviation, pointing out that mobilization is going to have knock-on effects on their ability to actually, uh, you know, keep the sky safe um, on military defense as well. And maybe some of these people who were previously trolls in the Internet Research Agency are some of the people who are now, you know, heading out over a, uh, over a border because of the fears of being mobilised onto the battlefield. As you say, though, I mean, the Defence Ministry and others are going to be trying to retain, but there's clearly something major happening here. And uh, in the absence of seeing somebody at the mic, I see there's actually a somewhat related question uh, coming in here on the screen about whether there's any indication that the Russian efforts in Ukraine will limit their resources to conduct disinformation or cyber campaigns in upcoming elections. Now, I suppose that's a reference to our elections here uh, in, uh, you know, 2022 midterms, obviously coming up closely or perhaps, you know, looking ahead or, you know, other elections inside of Europe. But I think it is related to this idea about whether Russia and the mobilization and other efforts in Ukraine are going to have any impact on their capacity, you know, for cyber uh, operations overall. Biliana, have, have you got thoughts? And then Martin. Yeah, I've thought about this and I... I wish I could say, hey, the Russians are distracted right now, so their priority is create domestic stability or at least hold, the, hold Moscow together, hold the ship together, and make sure that you, you continue to maintain some sort of credibility of a plausible victory in Ukraine or something along those lines so they wouldn't do anything um, during the 2022 elections. But I think, especially from recent reports from Met and Mandiant uh, that were talking, one was talking about cyber operations, the other about uh, taking down fake accounts. I think that now is a good time for a number of reasons. I, I believe we will see disruptive operations and different types of operations that will try to erode our confidence in the democratic process around the 2022 elections. One of them, the, one of the reasons is because Russia is angry at the United States. 
we are enemy number one. We've been supporting Ukraine for, for many years and especially over the past few months and the Russian government wants to retaliate. And as they're getting more and more logistically cha challenged in Ukraine, they may want to score a victory. And a victory for domestic purposes could be probably easier to achieve if um, the Russian government, let's say Putin can demonstrate that uh, candidates are corrupt, somehow our um, election process is fraudulent and they can bring that narrative home to demonstrate to the Russians that, hey, the West is not that good, especially now when Russians are fleeing and trying to get to, to Europe. It, it is a good time for Putin to try to show that, hey, Europe is worse than us, they're corrupt, they're dysfunctional, stay here. So I think for those reasons we may see cyber operations, and I think they may be more disruptive because until when I was writing the book, I had this argument that the Russian government is more aggressive in former Eastern Bloc states and less aggressive towards the West. But this was before February of this year. And we had a lot of, a lot of tools with which we could retaliate. I think the Russian government exercised restraint because we could impose sanctions, um, we could help Ukraine, we could do a lot of other things. But at this point, what options do we have left? We've exhausted so many of our ability to, to somehow constrain them that I think at this point there is not really any restriction on them doing disruptive operations, launching disruptive cyber operations through wiper malware, or ransomware attacks, or combination of those. And uh, I think that's probably what we're going to see. Martin, do you have um, additional thoughts on that? And of course, actually, one of the questions um, here, and I, I, I think, uh, I'm just going to check, you want to have a question? You do too. Okay, good. Because one of the other questions um, here, uh, as um, uh, Biliana is saying, I mean, elections and attacks and one thing, but the broader sets of attacks. One of the questions um, coming in um, from um, our um, online audience is about uh, could the Russians be sabotaging the Nord Stream pipeline? Now, it doesn't look like it's a cyber attack because uh, obviously there's been detection of explosions, so it's uh, obviously something you know, somewhat uh, different. But you know, um, that actually does raise that broader question about um, whether the Russians have retained that capacity to do a lot of other things, maybe in the cyber and you know, other space, not just for the elections, but more broadly, as uh, Biliana was uh, suggesting. Um, let me make two comments. Yeah. First comment is, we talk about information campaigns against elections. Elections are actually composed of two processes. There is the political process that basically terminates in a potential voter having, a potential, having an opinion about the candidates and an intention to vote for them. Okay? That's an inherently messy process that the Russians added to the mess in 2016 and have tried to add to the mess ever since. Then there's the process by which a person's intention is translated into a counted vote. In other words, the integrity of the election process, which the Russians had no influence on and is actually a very difficult process to have an influence on because of the nature of voting and voting machines. Okay? If, and if I go further on this, I'm going to end up saying something political, uh, and I really hate to do that here. So... Let me, let me go on to, uh, to some of these things. Um, in terms of the Nord Stream Pipeline, and I must say, the old cliche, I only know what I read in the papers, yeah. which, by the way, this common use of the word papers indicates just how old I really am. <laughs> okay, students, we used to have something called a paper. I still read them. <laughs> um, you can cause an explosion with a cyber attack, but it requires being able to manipulate the pressures in such right, a way. Exactly. And I'm not enough of an expert in underwater pipelines to understand if it's possible to cause errant commands that can cause an explosion. Um, there have been indications there have been Russian ships near the area. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that it took place underwater eliminates pretty much every possible um, perpetrator except those that actually have navies. <laughs> so you're really down to a handful. Um, it's a strange, strange move if it's done by the Russians. And I would have to say uh, the Russians are how I would place my bets if this were a casino. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, I, well, I... Now, I just, um, for uh. those of you who might not be, you know, kind of uh, as familiar with Putin as <laughs> some of us are for our sins, 
He spends a lot of time talking about his father and his father's activities during World War II. And one of his father seems to have done all kinds of things. He's a kind of regular man for all occasions, uh, according to Putin. And one of these is he was in a destruction battalion for the NKVD in one of the forerunners of the KGB, behind enemy lines and what is modern day Estonia, destroying infrastructure so the enemy could not take it, the enemy being Nazi Germany. And so, you know, Putin's whole stories of his father destroying the old um, Soviet and other um, infrastructure so that the enemy can't use it. And that would fit in with Nord Stream 2. If we're not going to take the gas, you know, this is supposed to be for the benefit of Germany. You know, why not destroy it? So anyway, that, that, I wouldn't be at all surprised if that's, you know, kind of part of the uh, thinking because Putin is certainly into if I can't have it, I'm going to destroy it and making that very clear. But so you had a, um, a question here and then... Uh, so here, and I'll try to get back to the couple of questions that were still online as well. My question's for Martin. Do you think it's the possibility of Yergeny uh, Brzozov? He's the head of the Wagner Group, and that's the reason there's such an amateur cyber attack, because he's not as sophisticated as a sovereign nation. Well, I mean, the Russians have had at least three organizations, the GRU, the FSB, and the SVR, all of whom have been implicated in cyber attacks. Plus, the Russians have a number of criminal groups. Our evil, I think, is one of them. There's a lot of them, and they change their names a lot, I believe. The Russians have a lot of assets they could call on. So it's not like they have to go to the Wagner Group, okay, which anyway didn't really make its reputation in cyber because they spent most of their time fighting in places where there weren't a whole lot of computers. So, probably not. Sir. when the Russians uh, took Crimea. And my question is really for Biana about disinformation. My experience then, and continue I have the view today, that disinformation is generally overhyped, and there's a lot of fear and hype around it. And it doesn't actually work very well. I recall um, maybe the Russians had some success earlier in the 2000s on, with disinformation about Timoshenko, but when Yanukovych um, you know, reneged on the accession agreement and the Maidan surprised the Kremlin, the protests in the Maidan, and they, to the point that I think President Putin and others think it was engineered by the United States and others, uh, really, and it wasn't organic. Uh, but even years after the uh, Maidan protests, the Ukrainian views of Russians really turned sharply against Russia. So he's failing to change the minds of Ukrainians. He has failed. Um, and the question is for you, is it because disinformation just doesn't work very well? Or, is, or do the Russians just not do it well? Or in this particular case with Ukraine, it was uh, just a hard target for them to change minds? I think this is a really interesting question, um, just for a moment, just to add on to this, because, um, you know, obviously the question about whether disinformation failed in Ukraine, but did that same disinformation fail in the West? I think is a, is a question... Uh, to add on to this as well, because we have a lot of Western audiences who have bought into a lot of Russian disinformation. Absolutely. And I can, I mean, I can give an example about the white helmets in Syria, you know, where I was in, I was in a meeting and there was Russians were sending out, you know, disinformation about the white helmets that was getting picked up in the Western press and even got picked up by leaders in a discussion that I was part of, where Ukrainians might have actually been more skeptical about it. So I'm, I'm kind of, I think your question's fantastic, but I wonder if it's, you know, something to do with different audiences and people having more familiarity with some of the issues. Absolutely. And I would say, excellent question. I've thought about this for, for a long time, and I think we have um, a problem. We tend to try to understand this information, and I'm going to say, Chris Paul told me about this differentiation, and I love it, so I'm going to use it. We measure performance and we don't measure effectiveness when it comes to disinformation. We measure how many people have engaged with a piece of disinformation, in which echo chambers they're talking about it, how many people have reshared it. But we don't really know. We haven't really had a study that tries to understand how it affects behavior and how it affects preferences. And I think a study like this is way overdue. And specifically in Ukraine, you're right, just from what we are seeing, the fierce defiance of the Ukrainian population is absolutely awe-inspiring to me. And I would say 
even without a study that particularly in Ukraine it is most likely failing. That said, a lot of foreigners, including in Bulgaria, I'm not going to mention how I know this, but I do have very close contacts who believe that the war is justified, that Putin is justified to have invaded because Ukrainians really are fascists, which to me is mind-blowing, but they are people that do listen to Russian propaganda and completely consume it and take it at face value. Well, we have a related question um, here coming in uh, from the online audience. Um, you know, just as uh, Bill was saying that, you know, Ukrainians aren't necessarily buying, you know, kind of what they're being sold in disinformation. There's a question here saying, are increased protests in Russia a sign that internal disinformation isn't working as much as external forces are disrupting Russia's ability uh, to, you know, conduct the disinformation? Um, so, you know, kind of what's playing you know, here in, in, in the Russian context. And Biliana, do you have any thoughts, and, and Martin, on that, uh, that subject? It's a great question. It's, it's really hard for me to say yes or no to answer in this way because it's a complicated answer, but I was astonished to see 39 protests in 39 cities the day after Putin announced the partial mobilization on September 21st. And I was literally sitting on... I was checking Twitter and, and checking all sorts of media to figure out, are we going to have finally a revolution and a coup? Is this going to happen? So many people took to the streets. But then they suppressed them with domestic forces and more than 1,400 people were arrested. It was a tragedy. But I would say definitely there are elements that don't believe the disinformation narratives in Russia, and I hope we see more of that sort of the protest potential of the population actually taking place. Yeah, Martin, what's, uh, what's your thoughts about this? I, I used to tell people before the invasion that uh, with 2014, Putin took a country which 50-50 split between Russia and the West. He took 10% of it, and then in the other 90%, it's 80-10 against him. So he ends up with a lot more... He ends up with a lot less influence than when he started. I tell this to people who think that Putin is a strategic genius. Um, he's more of an improviser, actually. Yeah, I think uh, that's right. Yeah. He's got strategic goals, but he just makes it up as he goes along, which you know, could backfire at this particular point. Fiona, what do you think? Well, look, I think you know, part of it is that he's taken away, he's decapitated the leadership of protests. Um, Alexei Navalny sitting in jail, making it you know, very clear that the, the barrier is very high. But it's the momentum of protests, because you know, now he's given people a sort of a sense that they've got nothing to lose if they're going to be sent to the battlefield. I mean, this really has change the calculation here. Um, I know that we've only got a little bit of time, um, and there was a couple of questions uh, that had come in online. I don't want to um, disappoint people that they haven't been asked, and I'll try to bring them together here. Um, there's a question about, do, and obviously because we're in the Naval Academy, I can't let this one not be asked, but do cyber and disinformation attacks present any unique particular threats to naval or amphibious operations? We obviously have to answer that. And then about Russian cyber attacks in Latin America as being a threat. And I do want to actually flag that Latin America has been actually one of the uh, you know, bases for Russia using for disinformation, uh, uh, more so than just cyber attacks. Uh, RT uh, in Latin America, Russia Today, has actually been much more effective even than English language and was used out of Venezuela, you know, often frequently, to, even in the case of Catalonia and the referendum in Spain, the Spanish government discovered that all of the propaganda you know, against the Spanish government in favour of independence in Catalonia was coming from Venezuela. But it wasn't coming from Venezuelans, it was coming from uh, you know, basically Russian operatives using Venezuela as a base. So, I mean, Martin, would you um, like to uh, say anything um, about um, either of these uh, two topics? Well, does cyber present any Navy unique? The first order answer is no, and the second order answer is yes. What do I mean by that? Basically, information systems are, tend to be similar throughout the Department of Defense, but Navy information systems, Navy has a different command and control culture than the other services. Uh, there has been a historical premium on independent action, and one of the things that navies do to protect themselves against sophisticated adversaries is not communicate. It's called emissions control. Uh, we used to do that a lot in the Cold War, then we forgot it, now we're relearning it. And that tends to t isolate certain navy assets from the rest of the world, and the more you isolate them, uh, the harder it is to carry out cyber operations against them. Yeah, and we've just had a late-breaking question coming in here about what a cyber civil defense would look like today. Um, 
I don't know if um, Biliana, well, you've been thinking about this all the time because we're certainly part of the public private sector here. Um, and I, I just mentioned Latin America, but I mean, obviously, in the, the work that you were doing at RAND, also at Deloitte, and now in the Krebs Stamos Group, you're looking at all of uh, these things on a, on a global, not just domestic scale. So, presumably, cyber civil defense on our part is also has to be taking an international view as well. Absolutely. I would say training the population to recognize this information and be aware of the threat and be aware of the fact that they could be a target and that there is a bigger picture at play here um, is very important. And I don't think we're, the awareness is, is enough among the U.S. population that there is a Russian government that has a military doctrine. And in that military doctrine, it stipulates that every single one of us is a target. So I think that message has to be made very clear. I also just think personally that having a cyber civil defense would start with looking at their books. So um, I just hope that uh, everyone will. I'm taking Martin's courses here at the, at the Naval Academy. Well, so I, uh, yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, I mean, I, I personally um, was very pleased to get both of them in the mail and have a chance to read them before the event. And I would just really encourage people to, you know, take a look because you'll get a, uh, an awful lot of information to help yourselves prepare because we're all part of this the cyber civil defense. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak here and fantastic uh, panelists. Let's give our panel a big hand. Yeah. Well, we can't uh, thank you enough for giving us your valuable time. And I think we could do this for another hour and keep the interest of the audience. But I wanna thank uh, Dr. Hill, Dr. Lubicki, Dr. Lilly, for giving us your precious time and sharing this uh, with us today. Um, we've got a gift for you. Um, it's shameless, Naval Institute Press book, Digital Influence Mercenaries, Profits and Power Through Information Warfare by J.F. Forrest. Excellent. And uh, we've got a gift for each of you, but uh, this doesn't cover your time, but uh, again, our sincere thanks, and let's give one more hand to our panel. Thank you, Thank you very much.